Hi, so in this video, I wanted to uh, continue uh, along the trends of, of discussing how protection works. And in some of the previous videos, I talked about techniques for specifically identifying malicious files. And, and as part of this, many anti-malware vendors use uh, additional techniques, uh, things like signatures, behavioral attributes, heuristics, and so on, to find bad files. But there are some additional technologies that can help uh, in this vein. And I, and I like to think of these as kind of the supporting cast uh, that a lot of the uh, the anti-malware technologies use. Uh, and the first uh, character, so to speak, in the supporting cast that I'd like to talk about is whitelisting. Now, everything that we've discussed so far has centered around identifying malicious files. And so at whitelisting, we actually take the opposite approach, which is how do we identify stuff that's actually clean? So if you kind of think of the spectrum of files, you might have kind of clean files on one end, Okay, and uh, then you might have a uh, kind of a continuum of files, and of course there's a lot of subjectivity, and it's a bit of a continuum, and uh, as you get to kind of the other end of the continuum, you have stuff that's sort of quite malicious, and really uh, there's some stuff in between that might be somewhat subjective in nature, uh, and, and then there's a bunch of stuff in between that's maybe in the gray zone, it's a bit more fuzzy, uh, so to speak, stuff that you know people don't have a clear, clear handle on. And the idea in whitelisting is, can we capture the, the stuff that's over here? Can we get all the, the clean stuff and, and find it? Now, you may be asking yourself, why do you care about finding clean stuff? Isn't the goal to find malware? Well, it turns out that whitelisting is useful in the context of protection in that it allows you to mitigate the risk of false positives. So if I can find good files, I can mitigate false positives because I can prevent legitimate applications from being inadvertently convicted by an anti-malware technology. And recall that we did say that when you inadvertently call a good file malicious, then that's called a false positive. And we obviously don't want to call uh, any good files malicious because that could be bad for the system, especially in light of the fact that many anti-malware technologies will delete a file if they think it's bad. So if they incorrectly label a file as bad, then that could cause serious repercussions if that file actually turned out to be good. And so by going ahead and identifying the clean stuff, we allow the, the existing technologies for identifying malware to only focus on that subset. So imagine you have you know, a, big, a big file system, and there'll be many, many files in that file system that, uh, uh, and actually, let me, let me actually call some of these gray, so that uh, to indicate that we don't know really what a lot of these things are. And maybe it turns out that we can identify a big chunk of them as clean. Let's say we identify that, hey, all these guys above are really absolutely clean. So now we can just strike them from consideration and focus all of our energy on what remains, which is this gray stuff here. And, and now instead of scanning the whole file system, we can now just scan these files for threats. Maybe we find out that, hey, this one and this one are actually bad. But this is the kind of thing that, that, that can be facilitated by whitelisting. And not only does it improve performance uh, to some degree, it also allows you to avoid calling one of these things bad, which, which would cause some serious repercussions from an overall efficacy perspective. Now, whitelisting is a very common term used in the industry, but it can have many different meanings. So at one end of the spectrum, people can perform standalone whitelisting. And this is where you would just deny by default any application that is not on a trusted list. And some people, that's when they talk about whitelisting, that's what they mean. They mean just deny everything by default unless we know it's good. Now, of course, with this approach, you probably would end up denying a lot of legitimate software. And there are situations in which Maybe something is unknown, let's say one of these files is unknown, and maybe if you took an approach where you're just going to deny everything from here on out, then you might end up denying a lot of unknown stuff that, that turns out to be actually clean. Um, and, and let's say we'll, we'll deny these things as well because we're going to deny anything that we don't know about. And now we're only going to allow this very small subset of applications to run in that system. And that's something you might want to do in some very rigid environments. Let's say you're in a situation in which you've got like nuclear secrets or some serious level of classified information, then on those systems, you might want to take a strict whitelisting approach. And, and similarly, maybe with certain users, certain users may get infected a lot, um, and they may be the kind who, who cause many outbreaks in an enterprise. And for those users, you might want to take an approach where those users can only run one of these N applications that we know to be good, and they're not allowed to run anything else. And you can support that and try to enforce that on specific end user machines. But I think that outside of these environments, standalone whitelisting where we just kind of deny by default unless we know something is good, that approach is very hard to pull off. And for that reason, the rest of the anti-malware industry thinks of whitelisting as a supporting technology. It really helps mitigate the risk of false positives that are caused by other technologies like behavioral 
technology and heuristic technology. And recall that we did say that behavioral and heuristic technologies, these things are a bit more aggressive in nature. And so they do cast a wider net and as such, they are more false positive prone and they can really benefit from having whitelisting there to kind of eliminate certain fouls from consideration so that the risk of an overall false positive is, is reduced as well. Now there are a bunch of techniques for uh, whitelisting files and, and again it's interesting because all the techniques we talked about earlier uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of blacklisting you can apply a similar set of techniques for whitelisting like for example you can use signatures for, for whitelisting. You can find files that are known to be good, come up with a signature for them and whitelist anything that matches that signature. You can do uh, fuzzy fingerprints, and, and we talked about this in the context earlier again of, of, of identifying threats, and so you can do fuzzy fingerprints. And anything that matches the fuzzy fingerprint can be called uh, good. Uh, similarly, you can do uh, heuristics, and you can do behavior, etc. And, and one technique that, that you can also use in the context of whitelisting, and, and this is something we didn't talk about much in the context of blacklisting, but it could be used a bit there as well, is prevalence. So prevalence is how often have you seen this file among your users? Like this is a file and you've seen it 10,000 times. Um, it's either going to be a known bad file, in other words, you'll have a signature for it, or it's going to be good because you very rarely see, you know, if something has just tons and tons and tons of users, it's very unlikely for that file to be malicious. Most malicious files tend to be micro-distributed. So just seeing a file with a lot of users may in and of itself be enough to say that this file is just conclusively uh, going to be good. Um, and, and if it were bad, there's a good chance you would have known about it through one of your existing signature technologies. Uh, and likewise, you can take uh, an approach where uh, instead of applying heuristics and behavior to every file, maybe we can say we only apply heuristics and behavioral techniques to the subset of files that have low prevalence because we know that um, everything that has high prevalence is either going to be clean or we'll have a signature for it. And so now we can restrict our attention to just things that are, that are lower in prevalence. And so that's another technique for identifying whether files are good or not. Uh, in terms of things like signatures, fuzzy fingerprints, and heuristics, uh, and even behavior, um, th there are sources for whitelist files. And, and certainly, uh, some sources include kind of standard OS files, so you can whitelist those. Uh, you can also whitelist um, files from customer machines. So for example, maybe uh, customers have files that they can provide you with uh, that they don't want to have convicted. Um, you can build crawlers. So you can find files on popular websites, websites that are unlikely to have malware. So for example, you can go to like Microsoft.com or, or you know, some site like that that's, that's, or Adobe.com that, that, um, that are popular software distributors and those sites are unlikely to contain uh, malicious files. So that's another way you can go and, and source clean files. You can find CD-ROMs, so maybe you can, you can go in, or, or DVD-ROMs nowadays, um, of known software applications, and you can go ahead and install those on a test system and, and whitelist everything that, that exists on those systems. Because again, typical malware doesn't traverse via CD-ROM or DVD-ROM, it typically nowadays goes and, and traverses over the internet and, and propagates that way. So that's yet another technique you can use for whitelisting. But overall, you know, whitelisting, again, there are multiple aspects of it. Uh, at one extreme, you can use whitelisting for just doing a deny by default approach for, for people who tend to get infected a lot or for very strict security environments. And for, for other people, you can have whitelisting be something that supports existing antivirus technology. And in fact, a lot of vendors do have uh, a whitelisting component uh, in their systems. Uh, and they use that to protect uh, their customers from threats while not causing any false positives. Hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to making some more for you.